Chapter Nineteen of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen. Litvinov went quickly up the staircase of the Hotel de l'Europe. A little girl of thirteen, with a sly little face of Kalmuk cast, who had apparently been on the lookout for him, stopped him, saying in Russian come this way please irina pavlovna will be here directly he looked at her in perplexity she smiled repeated come along come along and led him to a small room facing irina's bedroom and filled with travelling trunks and portmanteaus then at once disappeared closing the door very softly litvinov had not time to look about him before the door was quickly opened and before him, in a pink ball-dress, with pearls in her hair and on her neck, stood Irina. She simply rushed at him, clutched him by both hands, and for a few instants was speechless. Her eyes were shining, and her bosom heaving as though she had run up to a height. "'I could not receive you there,' she began in a hurried whisper. "'We are just going to a dinner-party, but I wanted above everything to see you.' that is your betrothed i suppose with whom i met you to-day yes that was my betrothed said litvinov with emphasis on the word was and so i wanted to see you for one minute to tell you that you must consider yourself absolutely free that everything that happened yesterday ought not to affect your plans irina cried litvinov why are you saying this he uttered these words in a loud voice there was the note in them of unbounded passion. Irina involuntarily closed her eyes for a minute. "'Oh, my sweet one!' she went on in a whisper still more subdued, but with unrestrained emotion. "'You don't know how I love you. But yesterday I only paid my debt. I made up for the past. Ah, I could not give you back my youth as I would, but I have laid no obligations on you i have exacted no promise of any sort of you my sweet do what you will you are free as air you are bound in no way understand that understand that but i can't live without you irina litvinov interrupted in a whisper now i am yours for ever and always since yesterday i can only breathe at your feet he stooped down all in a tremble to kiss her hands Irina gazed at his bent head. "'Then let me say,' she said, "'that I too am ready for anything, that I too will consider no one and nothing. As you decide, so it shall be. I too am for ever yours, yours.' Someone tapped warily at the door. Irina stooped, whispered once more, "'Yours. Good-bye.' Litvinov felt her breath on his hair, the touch of her lips. When he stood up, she was no longer in the room, but her dress was rustling in the corridor, and from the distance came the voice of Ratmirov. Ah, bien, vous ne venez pas? Litvinov sat down on a high chest and hid his face. A feminine fragrance, fresh and delicate, hung about him. Irina had held his hand in her hands. It's too much, too much, was his thought. The little girl came into the room, and smiling again in response to his agitated glance, said, "'Kindly come now.' He got up and went out of the hotel. It was no good even to think of returning home. He had to regain his balance first. His heart was beating heavily and unevenly. The earth seemed faintly reeling under his feet. Litvinov turned again along the Lichtenthaler Alley. He realized that the decisive moment had come, that to put it off longer, to dissemble, to turn away, had become impossible, that an explanation with Tatyana had become inevitable. He could imagine how she was sitting there, never stirring, waiting for him. He could foresee what he would say to her. But how was he to act? How was he to begin? He had turned his back on his upright, well-organized, orderly future. He knew that he was flinging himself headlong into a gulf, but that did not confound him. The thing was done, but how was he to face his judge? And if only his judge would come to meet him, an angel with a flaming sword, 
that would be easier for a sinning heart instead of which he had himself to plunge the knife in infamous but to turn back to abandon that other to take advantage of the freedom offered him recognized as his no better to die no he would have none of such loathsome freedom but would humble himself in the dust and might those eyes look down on him with love grigory mikhailitch said a melancholy voice and some one's hand was laid heavily upon litvinov he looked round in some alarm and recognized potugin i beg your pardon grigory mikhailitch began the latter with his customary humility i am disturbing you perhaps but seeing you in the distance i thought however if you're not in the humour on the contrary i'm delighted litvinov muttered between his teeth potugin walked beside him what a lovely evening he began so warm have you been walking long no not long why do i ask though i've just seen you come out of the hotel de l'europe then you've been following me yes you have something to say to me yes potugin repeated hardly audibly litvinov stopped and looked at his uninvited companion his face was pale his eyes moved restlessly his contorted features seemed overshadowed by old long-standing grief what do you specially want to say to me litvinov said slowly and he moved forward ah with your permission directly if it's all the same to you let us sit down here on this seat it will be most convenient why this is something mysterious litvinov declared seating himself near him you don't seem quite yourself sozont ivanitch no i'm all right and it's nothing mysterious either i specially wanted to tell you the impression made on me by your betrothed she is betrothed to you i think well anyway by the girl to whom you introduced me to-day i must say that in the course of my whole existence i have never met a more attractive creature a heart of gold a really angelic nature potugin uttered all these words with the same bitter and mournful air so that even litvinov could not help noticing the incongruity between his expression of face and his speech you have formed a perfectly correct estimate of tatyana petrovna litvinov began though i can't help being surprised first that you should be aware of the relation in which i stand to her and secondly that you should have understood her so quickly she really has an angelic nature but allow me to ask did you want to talk to me about this it's impossible not to understand her at once potugin replied quickly as though evading the last question one need only take one look into her eyes she deserves every possible happiness on earth and enviable is the fate of the man whose lot it is to give her that happiness one must hope he may prove worthy of such a fate litvinov frowned slightly excuse me sozont ivanitch he said i must confess our conversation strikes me as altogether rather original i should like to know does the hint contained in your words refer to me potugin did not at once answer litvinov he was visibly struggling with himself. Grigory Mikhailitch, he began at last, either I am completely mistaken in you, or you are capable of hearing the truth, from whomsoever it may come, and in however unattractive a form it may present itself. I told you just now that I saw where you came from. Why, from the Hôtel de l'Europe. What of that? I know, of course, whom you have been to see there what you have been to see madame radmirov well i have been to see her what next what next you betrothed to tatyana petrovna have been to see madame radmirov whom you love and who loves you litvinov instantly got up from the seat the blood rushed to his head what's this he cried at last in a voice of concentrated exasperation stupid jesting spying kindly explain yourself potugin turned a weary look upon him ah don't be offended at my words 
Grigory Mikhailitch, me you cannot offend. I did not begin to talk to you for that, and I am in no joking humour now. Perhaps, perhaps, I am ready to believe in the excellence of your intentions, but still I may be allowed to ask you by what right you meddle in the private affairs, in the inner life, of another man, a man who is nothing to you, and what grounds you have for so confidently giving out your own invention for the truth. My invention? If I had imagined it, it should not have made you angry, and as for my right, well, I never heard before that a man ought to ask himself whether he had the right to hold out a hand to a drowning man. I am humbly grateful for your tender solicitude, cried Litvinov passionately, but I am not in the least in need of it, and all the phrases about the ruin of inexperienced young men wrought by society women about the immorality of fashionable society, and so on, I look upon merely as stock phrases, and indeed, in a sense, I positively despise them, and so I beg you to spare your rescuing arm, and to let me drown in peace." Potugin again raised his eyes to Litvinov. He was breathing hard, his lips were twitching. "'But look at me, young man,' broke from him, at last, and he clapped himself on the breast. Can you suppose I have anything in common with the ordinary, self-satisfied moralist, a preacher? Don't you understand that simply from interest in you, however strong it might be, I would never have let fall a word, I would never have given you grounds for reproaching me with what I hate above all things, indiscretion, intrusiveness? Don't you see that this is something of a different kind altogether, that before you is a man crushed, utterly obliterated by the very passion, from the results of which he would save you and, and, for the same woman." Litvinov stepped back a pace. "'Is it possible? What did you say? You? You, Sozont Ivanitch? But Madame Bielsky, that child? Ah, don't cross-examine me. Believe me. That is a dark, terrible story, and I'm not going to tell you it. Madame Bielsky I hardly knew, that child is not mine, but I took it all upon myself, because she wished it, because it was necessary for her. Why am I here in your hateful Baden? And, in fact, could you suppose, could you for one instant imagine, that I'd have brought myself to caution you out of sympathy for you? I'm sorry for that sweet, good girl, your fiancé but what have I to do with your future, with you both? But I am afraid for her, for her." "'You do me great honour, Mr. Potugin,' began Litvinov. But since, according to you, we are both in the same position, why is it you don't apply such exhortations to yourself, and ought I not to ascribe your apprehensions to another feeling? That is, to jealousy, you mean? Ah, young man, young man, it's shameful of you to shuffle and make pretenses. It's shameful of you not to realise what a bitter sorrow is speaking to you now by my lips. No, I am not in the same position as you. I, I am old, ridiculous, an utterly harmless old fool. But you... But there's no need to talk about it. You would not for one second agree to accept the position I fill, and fill with gratitude. Jealousy? A man is not jealous who has never had even a drop of hope, and this is not the first time it has been my lot to endure this feeling. I am only afraid, afraid for her, understand that. And could I have guessed when she sent me to you that the feeling of having wronged you, she owned to feeling that, would carry her so far? But excuse me, Sozont Ivanitch, you seem to know... I know nothing, and I know everything. I know, he added, turning away, I know where she was yesterday. But there's no holding her back now. Like a stone set rolling, she must roll on to the bottom. I should be a great idiot indeed, if I imagined my words could hold you back at once. You, when a woman like that... But that's enough of this. I couldn't restrain myself, that's my whole excuse. And after all, how can one know, and why not try? Perhaps you will think again. Perhaps some word of mine will go to your heart. You will not care to ruin her and yourself, and that innocent, sweet creature. Ah, 
don't be angry, don't stamp about. What have I to fear? Why should I mince matters? It's not jealousy speaking in me, not anger. I'm ready to fall at your feet, to beseech you. Good-bye, though. You needn't be afraid. All this will be kept secret. I wished for your good. Potugin strode off along the avenue and quickly vanished in the now falling darkness. Litvinov did not detain him. A terrible dark story, Potugin had said to Litvinov, and would not tell it. Let us pass it over with a few words only. Eight years before, it had happened to him to be sent by his department to Count Riesenbach as a temporary clerk. It was in the summer. Potugin used to drive to his country villa with papers, and be whole days there at a time. Irina was then living at the Count's. She was never haughty with people in a humbler station, at least she never treated them superciliously, and the Countess more than once reproved her for her excessive Moscow familiarity. Irina soon detected a man of intelligence in the humble clerk, attired in the stiffly buttoned frock-coat that was his uniform. She used often and eagerly to talk to him, while he, he fell in love with her passionately, profoundly, secretly. Secretly, so he thought. The summer passed. The Count no longer needed any outside assistance. Potugin lost sight of Irina, but could not forget her. Three years after, he utterly unexpectedly received an invitation, through a third person, to go to see a lady slightly known to him. This lady at first was reluctant to speak out. But after exacting an oath from him, to keep everything he was going to hear absolutely secret, she proposed to him, to marry a girl who occupied a conspicuous position in society, and for whom marriage had become a necessity. The lady scarcely ventured to hint at the principal personage, and then promised Potugin money, a large sum of money. Potugin was not offended. Astonishment stifled all feeling of anger in him. But of course he point-blank declined. Then the lady handed him a note. From Irina. You are a generous, noble man, she wrote, and I know you would do anything for me. I beg of you this sacrifice. You will save one who is very dear to me. In saving her you will save me too. Do not ask me how. I could never have brought myself to any one with such an entreaty, but to you I hold out my hands and say to you, Do it for my sake. Potugin pondered, and said that for Irina Pavlovna certainly he was ready to do a great deal, but he should like to hear her wishes from her own lips. The interview took place the same evening. It did not last long, and no one knew of it, except the same lady. Irina was no longer living at Count Riesenbach's. "'What made you think of me, of all people?' Potugin asked her. She was beginning to expiate on his noble qualities, but suddenly she stopped. "'No,' she said, "'you must be told the truth. I know, I know that you love me. So that was why I made up my mind. And then she told him everything. Eliza Bielski was an orphan. Her relations did not like her, and reckoned on her inheritance. Ruin was facing her. In saving her, Irina was really doing a service to him who was responsible for it all, and who was himself now standing in a very close relation to Irina. Potugin, without speaking, looked long at Irina, and consented. She wept, and flung herself all in tears on his neck. And he too wept, but very different were their tears. Everything had already been made ready for the secret marriage, a powerful hand removed all obstacles. But illness came, and then a daughter was born, and then the mother poisoned herself. What was to be done with the child? Potugin received it into his charge, received it from the same hands, from the hands of Irina. A terrible, dark story. Let us pass on, readers, pass on. Over an hour more passed before Litvinov could bring himself to go back to his hotel. He had almost reached it when he suddenly heard steps behind him. It seemed as though they were following him persistently, 
and walking faster when he quickened his pace. When he moved under a lamp-post, Litvinov turned round and recognised General Radmirov. In a white tie, in a fashionable overcoat, flung open, with a row of stars and crosses on a golden chain, in the buttonhole of his dress-coat, the general was returning from dinner alone. His eyes, fastened with insolent persistence on Litvinov, expressed such contempt and such hatred, his whole deportment was suggestive of such intense defiance, that Litvinov thought it his duty, stifling his wrath, to go to meet him, to face a scandal. But when he was on a level with Litvinov, the general's face suddenly changed, his habitual playful refinement reappeared upon it, and his hand in its pale lavender glove flourished his glossy hat high in the air. Litvinov took off his in silence, and each went on his way. "'He has noticed something, for certain,' thought Litvinov. "'If only it were any one else,' thought the general. Tatyana was playing piquet with her aunt when Litvinov entered their room. "'Well, I must say, you're a pretty fellow,' cried Kapitolina Markovna, and she threw down her cards. "'Our first day, and he's lost for the whole evening. Here we've been waiting and waiting, and scolding and scolding.' "'I said nothing, aunt,' observed Tatyana. "'Well, your meekness itself, we all know. You ought to be ashamed, sir, and you betrothed, too.' Litvinov made some sort of excuse, and sat down to the table. "'Why have you left off your game?' he asked, after a brief silence. "'Well, that's a nice question. We've been playing cards from sheer dullness, not knowing what to do with ourselves. But now you've come.' "'If you would care to hear the evening music,' observed Litvinov, "'I should be delighted to take you.' Kapitolina Markovna looked at her niece. "'Let us go, aunt. I am ready,' she said. "'But wouldn't it be better to stay at home?' "'To be sure. Let us have tea in our old Moscow way, with the samovar, and have a good chat. We've not had a proper gossip yet.' Litvinov ordered tea to be sent up, but the good chat did not come off. He felt a continual gnawing of conscience. Whatever he said, it always seemed to him that he was telling lies, and Tachana was seeing through it. Meanwhile, there was no change to be observed in her. She behaved just as unconstrainedly, only her look never once rested upon Litvinov, but with a kind of indulgent timorousness glided over him, and she was paler than usual. Kapitolina Markovna asked her whether she had not a headache. Tatyana was at first about to say no, but after a moment's thought she said, Yes, a little. It's the journey, suggested Litvinov, and he positively blushed with shame. Yes, the journey, repeated Tatyana, and her eyes again glided over him. You ought to rest, Tanya, darling. Yes, I will go to bed soon, aunt. On the table lay a guide de voyageur. Litvinov fell to reading aloud the description of the environs of Baden. "'Quite so,' Kapitolina Markovna interrupted. "'But there's something we mustn't forget. I'm told linen is very cheap here, so we must be sure to buy some for the trousseau.' Tatyana dropped her eyes. "'We have plenty of time, aunt. You never think of yourself. But you really ought to get yourself some clothes. You see how smart everyone is here.' "'Eh, hey, my love, what would be the good of that? I'm not a fine lady. It would be another thing if I were such a beauty as your friend, Grigory Mikhailitch. What was her name?' "'What friend?' "'Why, that we met today. "'Oh, she,' said Litvinov, with feigned indifference, and again he felt disgust and shame. "'No,' he thought, "'to go on like this is impossible.' He was sitting by his betrothed, while a few inches from her in his side-pocket was Irina's handkerchief. Kapitolina Markovna went for a minute into the other room. "'Tanya,' said Litvinov, with an effort. It was the first time that day he had called her by that name. She turned towards him. "'I... I have something very important to say to you.' "'Oh, really? When?' 
Directly? No, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Very well. Litvinov's soul was suddenly filled with boundless pity. He took Tatyana's hand and kissed it humbly, like a sinner. Her heart throbbed faintly, and she felt no happiness. In the night, at two o'clock, Kapitolina Markovna, who was sleeping in the same room with her niece, suddenly lifted up her head and listened. Tanya, she said, you are crying? Tatyana did not at once answer. No, aunt, sounded her gentle voice. I have caught a cold. End of chapter 19「Twenty of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty. Why did I say that to her? Litvinov thought the next morning as he sat in his room at the window. He shrugged his shoulders in vexation. He had said that to Tatyana simply to cut himself off all way of retreat. In the window lay a note from Irina. She asked him to see her at twelve. Potugin's words incessantly recurred to his mind. They seemed to reach him with a faint ill-omened sound as of a rumbling underground. He was angry with himself, but could not get rid of them anyhow. Someone knocked at the door. Verda? asked Litvinov. Ah, you're at home. Open. He heard Bindasov's hoarse bass. The door handle creaked. Litvinov turned white with exasperation. I'm not at home, he declared sharply. Not at home? That's a good joke. I tell you, not at home. Get along. That's civil, and I came to ask you for a little loan, grumbled Bindasov. He walked off, however, tramping on his heels as usual. Litvinov was all but dashing out after him. He felt such a longing to throttle the hateful ruffian. The events of the last few days had unstrung his nerves. A little more, and he would have burst into tears. He drank off a glass of cold water, locked up all the drawers in the furniture, he could not have said why, and went to Tatyana's. He found her alone. Kapitolina Markovna had gone out shopping. Tatyana was sitting on the sofa, holding a book in both hands. She was not reading it, and scarcely knew what book it was. She did not stir, but her heart was beating quickly in her bosom, and the little white collar round her neck quivered visibly and evenly. Litvinov was confused. However, he sat down by her, said good morning, smiled at her. She too smiled at him without speaking. She had bowed to him when he came in, bowed courteously, not affectionately, and she did not glance at him. He held out his hand to her. She gave him her chill fingers, but at once freed them again, and took up the book. Litvinov felt that to begin the conversation with unimportant subjects would be insulting Tatyana. She, after her custom, made no demands, but everything in her said plainly, I am waiting, I am waiting. He must fulfil his promise. But though almost the whole night he had thought of nothing else, he had not prepared even the first introductory words, and absolutely did not know in what way to break this cruel silence. Tanya, he began at last, I told you yesterday that I have something important to say to you. I am ready, only I beg you beforehand not to be angry against me, and to rest assured that my feelings for you... He stopped. He caught his breath. Tatyana still did not stir and did not look at him. She only clutched the book tighter than ever. "'There has always been,' Litvinov went on, without finishing the sentence he had begun, "'there has always been perfect openness between us. I respect you too much to be a hypocrite with you. I want to prove to you that I know how to value the nobleness and independence of your nature, even though, though, of course—' "'Grigory Mikhailitch,' began Tatyana, in a measured voice, while a deathly pallor overspread her whole face. I will come to your assistance. You no longer love me, and you don't know how to tell me so. Litvinov involuntarily shuddered. Why, he said, 
hardly intelligibly. Why could you suppose? I really don't understand. What? Isn't it the truth? Isn't it the truth? Tell me, tell me. Tatyana turned quite round to Litvinov. Her face, with her hair brushed back from it, approached his face, and her eyes, which for so long had not looked at him, seemed to penetrate into his eyes. "'Isn't it the truth?' she repeated. He said nothing, did not utter a single sound. He could not have lied at that instant, even if he had known she would believe him, and that his lie would save her. He was not even able to bear her eyes upon him. Litvinov said nothing, but she needed no answer. She read the answer in his very silence, in those guilty downcast eyes, and she turned away again and dropped the book. She had been still uncertain till that instant, and Litvinov understood that. He understood that she had been still uncertain, and how hideous, actually hideous, was all that he was doing. He flung himself on his knees before her. Tanya, he cried, if only you knew how hard it is for me to see you in this position, how awful to me to think that it's I, I. My heart is torn to pieces, I don't know myself, I have lost myself, and you, and everything. Everything is shattered, Tanya, everything. Could I dream that I... I should bring such a blow upon you, my best friend, my guardian angel. Could I dream that we should meet like this, should spend such a day as yesterday? Tanya was trying to get up and go away. He held her back by the border of her dress. No, listen to me a minute longer. You see, I am on my knees before you, but I have not come to beg your forgiveness. You cannot, you ought not to forgive me. I have come to tell you that your friend is ruined, that he is falling into the pit, and would not drag you down with him. But save me, no. Even you cannot save me. I should push you away. I am ruined, Tanya. I am ruined past all help. Tanya looked at Litvinov. You are ruined? she said, as though not fully understanding him. You are ruined? Yes, Tanya, I am ruined all the past, all that was precious, everything I have lived for up till now, is ruined for me. Everything is wretched, everything is shattered, and I don't know what awaits me in the future. You said just now that I no longer loved you. No, Tanya, I have not ceased to love you, but a different, terrible, irresistible passion has come upon me, has overborne me. I fought against it while I could. Tatyana got up, her brows twitched, her pale face darkened. Litvinov, too, rose to his feet. "'You love another woman,' she began, "'and I guess who she is. We met her yesterday, didn't we? Well, I see what is left for me to do now, since you say yourself this passion is unalterable.' Tatyana paused an instant. Possibly she had still hoped Litvinov would not let this last word pass unchallenged but he said nothing. It only remains for me to give you back your word. Litvinov bent his head, as though submissively receiving a well-deserved blow. You have every right to be angry with me, he said. You have every right to reproach me for feebleness, for deceit. Tatyana looked at him again. I have not reproached you, Litvinov. I don't blame you. I agree with you. The bitterest truth is better than what went on yesterday. What sort of life could ours have been now? What sort of a life will mine be now? echoed mournfully in Litvinov's soul. Tatyana went towards the door of the bedroom. I will ask you to leave me alone for a little time, Grigory Mikhailitch. We will see each other again, we will talk again. All this has been so unexpected, I want to collect myself a little. Leave me alone, spare my pride. We shall see each other again. And uttering these words, Tatyana hurriedly withdrew and locked the door after her. Litvinov went out into the street, like a man dazed and stunned. In the very depths of his heart something dark and bitter lay hid. Such a sensation must a man feel who has murdered another and at the same time he felt easier as though he had at last flung off a hated load. 
Tatyana's magnanimity had crushed him. He felt vividly all that he had lost. And yet? With his regret was mingled irritation. He yearned towards Irina as to the sole refuge left him, and felt bitter against her. For some time Litvinov's feelings had been every day growing more violent and more complex. This complexity tortured him, exasperated him. He was lost in this chaos. He thirsted for one thing, to get out at last on to the path, whatever it might be, if only not to wander longer in this incomprehensible half-darkness. Practical people of Litvinov's sort ought never to be carried away by passion. It destroys the very meaning of their lives. But nature cares nothing for logic, our human logic. She has her own, which we do not recognize and do not acknowledge till we are crushed under its wheel. On parting from Tatyana, Litvinov held one thought in his mind, to see Irina. He set off indeed to see her. But the general was at home, so at least the porter told him, and he did not care to go in. He did not feel himself capable of hypocrisy, and he moved slowly off towards the conversation hall. Litvinov's incapacity for hypocrisy was evident that day to both Borshilov and Pishchalkin, who happened to meet him. He simply blurted out to the former that he was empty as a drum, to the latter that he bored everyone to extinction. It was lucky indeed that Bindasov did come across him. There would certainly have been a grosser scandal. Both the young men were stupefied. Voroshilov went so far as to ask himself whether his honour as an officer did not demand satisfaction. But like Gogol's lieutenant Pirogov, he calmed himself with bread and butter in a café. Litvinov caught sight in the distance of Kapitolina Markovna running busily from shop to shop in her striped mantle. He felt ashamed to face the good, absurd, generous old lady. Then he recalled Potugin, their conversation yesterday. Then something was wafted to him, something intangible and unmistakable. If a falling shadow shed a fragrance, it could not be more elusive. But he felt at once that it was Irina near him, and in fact she appeared a few paces from him, arm in arm with another lady. Their eyes met at once. Irina probably noticed something peculiar in the expression of Litvinov's face. She stopped before a window, in which a number of tiny wooden clocks of black forest make were exhibited, and summoning him by a motion of her head, she pointed to one of these clocks, and calling upon him to admire a charming clock face with a painted cuckoo above it, she said, not in a whisper, but as though finishing a phrase begun, in her ordinary tone of voice, much less likely to attract the attention of outsiders, "'Come in an hour's time. I shall be alone.' But at this moment the renowned lady-killer, Monsieur Verdier, swooped down upon her, and began to fall into ecstasies over the colour, fée morte, of her gown and the low-crowned Spanish hat she wore tilted almost down to her eyebrows. Litvinov vanished in the crowd. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of Smoke » Grigory, Irina was saying to him two hours later, as she sat beside him on the sofa, and laid both hands on his shoulder, « What is the matter with you? Tell me now quickly, while we're alone. The matter with me? said Litvinov. I am happy, happy, that's what's the matter with me. Irina looked down, smiled, sighed. That's not an answer to my question, my dear one. Litvinov grew thoughtful. Well, let me tell you then, since you insist positively on it. Irina opened her eyes wide and trembled slightly. I have told everything to-day to my betrothed. What? Everything? You mentioned me? Litvinov fairly threw up his arms. Irina, for God's sake, how could such an idea enter your head, that I— There, forgive me, forgive me. What did you say? I told her that I no longer loved her. She asked why? 
I did not disguise the fact that I loved another woman, and that we must part. Ah, and what did she do? Agreed? Oh, Irina, what a girl she is! She was all self-sacrifice, all generosity. I've no doubt, I've no doubt. There was nothing else for her to do, though. And not one reproach, not one hard word to me, who have spoiled her whole life, deceived her, pitilessly flung her over. Irina scrutinized her fingernails. Tell me, Grigory, did she love you? Yes, Irina, she loved me. Irina was silent a minute. She straightened her dress. I must confess, she began, I don't quite understand what induced you to explain matters to her. What induced me, Irina? Would you have liked me to lie, to be a hypocrite to her, that pure soul? Or did you suppose... I supposed nothing, Irina interrupted. I must admit, I have thought very little about her. I don't know how to think of two people at once. That is, you mean... Well, and so what then? Is she going away, that pure soul? Irina interrupted a second time. I know nothing, answered Litvinov. I am to see her again, but she will not stay. Ah, bon voyage! No, she will not stay. But I am not thinking of her either now. I am thinking of what you said to me, what you have promised me. Irina looked up at him from under her eyelids. Ungrateful one! Aren't you content yet? No, Irina, I am not content. You have made me happy, but I am not content and you understand me. That is, I... Yes, you understand me. Remember your words, remember what you wrote to me. I can't share you with others. No, no, I can't consent to the pitiful role of secret lover. Not my life alone, this other life too I have flung at your feet. I have renounced everything, I have crushed it all to dust, without compunction and beyond recall. But in return, I trust, I firmly believe that you too will keep your promise and unite your lot with mine for ever. You want me to run away with you? I am ready. Litvinov bent down to her hands in ecstasy. I am ready. I will not go back from my word. But have you yourself thought over all the difficulties? Have you made preparations? I, I have not had time yet to think over or prepare anything, but only say yes. Let me act, and before a month is over... A month? We start for Italy in a fortnight. A fortnight, then, is enough for me. Oh, Irina, you seem to take my proposition coldly. Perhaps it seems unpractical to you. But I am not a boy, and I am not used to comforting myself with dreams. I know what a tremendous step this is. I know what a responsibility I am taking on myself. But I can see no other course think of it. I must break every tie with the past, if only not to be a contemptible liar in the eyes of the girl I have sacrificed for you." Irina drew herself up suddenly, and her eyes flashed. "'Oh, I beg your pardon, Grigory Mikhailitch. If I decide, if I run away, then it will at least be with a man who does it for my sake, for my sake simply and not in order that he may not degrade himself in the good opinion of a phlegmatic young person, with milk and water, du lait coupé, instead of blood in her veins. And I must tell you, too, it's the first time, I confess, that it's been my lot to hear that the man I honour with my regard is deserving of commiseration, playing a pitiful part. I know a far more pitiful part, the part of a man who doesn't know what is going on in his own heart. Litvinov drew himself up in his turn. Irina, he was beginning. But all at once she clapped both hands to her forehead, and with a convulsive motion, flinging herself on his breast, she embraced him with force beyond a woman's. Forgive me, forgive me, she began, with a shaking voice. Forgive me, Grigory. You see how corrupted I am, how horrid I am, how jealous and wicked. You see how I need your aid, your indulgence. Yes, save me, drag me out of this mire before I am quite ruined. 
Yes, let us run away, let us run away from these people, from this society, to some far-off, fair, free country. Perhaps your Irina will at last be worthier of the sacrifices you are making for her. Don't be angry with me, forgive me, my sweet, and know that I will do everything you command. I will go anywhere you will take me." Litvinov's heart was in a turmoil. Irina clung closer than before to him with all her youthful, supple body. He bent over her fragrant, disordered tresses, and, in an intoxication of gratitude and ecstasy, he hardly dared to caress them with his hand, he hardly touched them with his lips. Irina, Irina, he repeated, my angel. She suddenly raised her head, listened. It's my husband's step. He has gone into his room, she whispered, and, moving hurriedly away, she crossed over to another armchair. Litvinov was getting up. What are you doing? she went on in the same whisper. You must stay. He suspects you as it is. Or are you afraid of him? She did not take her eyes off the door. Yes, it's he. He will come in here directly. Tell me something. Talk to me. Litvinov could not at once recover himself, and was silent. "'Aren't you going to the theatre to-morrow?' she uttered aloud. "'They're giving La Verdeur, an old-fashioned piece, and Plessy is awfully affected. We're in as though we were in a perfect fever,' she added, dropping her voice. "'We can't do anything like this. We must think things over well. I ought to warn you that all my money is in his hands. Mais jamais bijou. We'll go to Spain. Would you like that?" She raised her voice again. Why is it all actresses get so fat? Madeleine Brohan, for instance. Do talk. Don't sit so silent. My head is going round. But you, you must not doubt me. I will let you know where to come to-morrow. Only it was a mistake to have told that young lady. Ah! Mais c'est charmant! she cried suddenly and with a nervous laugh she tore the lace edge of her handkerchief. "'May I come in?' asked Ratmirov from the other room. "'Yes, yes.' The door opened, and in the doorway appeared the general. He scowled on seeing Litvinov. However, he bowed to them, that is to say, he bent the upper portion of his person. "'I did not know you had a visitor,' he said. "'Je vous demande pardon de mon indiscretion.' So you still find Baden entertaining, Monsieur Litvinov? Ratmirov always uttered Litvinov's surname with hesitation, every time, as though he had forgotten it, and could not at once recall it. In this way, as well as by the lofty flourish of his hat in saluting him, he meant to insult his pride. I am not bored here, Monsieur le Général. Really? Well, I find Baden fearfully boring. We are soon going away, are we not, Irina Pavlovna? Assez de bad comme ca. By the way, I've won you five hundred francs today. Irina stretched out her hand coquettishly. Where are they? Please let me have them for pin money. You shall have them, you shall have them. You are going, Monsieur Litvinov? Yes, I am going, as you see. Ratmirov again bent his body till we meet again. Good-bye, Grigory Mikhailitch, said Irina. I will keep my promise. What is that? May I be inquisitive? her husband inquired. Irina smiled. No, it was only something we've been talking of. Say à propos du voyage. Où il vous plaire? You know, Stale's book? Ah, ah, to be sure. I know. Charming illustrations. Ratmirov seemed on the best of terms with his wife. He called her by her pet name in addressing her. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Better not think now, really. Litvinov repeated, as he strode along the street, feeling that the inward riot was rising up again in him. 
The thing's decided, she will keep her promise, and it only remains for me to take all necessary steps. Yet she hesitates, it seems. He shook his head. His own designs struck even his own imagination in a strange light. There was a smack of artificiality, of unreality about them. One cannot dwell long upon the same thoughts. They gradually shift like the bits of glass in a kaleidoscope. One peeps in, and already the shapes before one's eyes are utterly different. A sensation of intense weariness overcame Litvinov. If he could for one short hour but rest! But Tanya? He started, and, without reflecting even, turned submissively homewards, merely struck by the idea that this day was tossing him like a ball from one to the other. No matter. He must make an end. He went back to his hotel, and with the same submissiveness, insensibility, numbness, without hesitation or delay, he went to see Tatyana. He was met by Kapitolina Markovna. From the first glance at her, he knew that she knew about it all. The poor maiden lady's eyes were swollen with weeping, and her flushed face, fringed with her dishevelled white locks, expressed dismay and an agony of indignation, sorrow, and boundless amazement. She was on the point of rushing up to Litvinov, but she stopped short, and, biting her quivering lip, she looked at him as though she would supplicate him, and kill him, and assure herself that it was a dream, a senseless, impossible thing, wasn't it? "'Here you, you are come,' she began. The door from the next room opened instantaneously, and with a light tread Tatyana came in. She was of a transparent pallor, but she was quite calm. She gently put one arm round her aunt and made her sit down beside her. "'You sit down too, Grigory Mikhailitch,' she said to Litvinov, who was standing like one distraught at the door. "'I am very glad to see you once more. I have informed auntie of your decision, our common decision. She fully shares it and approves of it. Without mutual love there can be no happiness. Mutual esteem alone is not enough.' At the word esteem Litvinov involuntarily looked down and better to separate now than to repent later isn't it aunt yes of course began kapitolina markovna of course tanya darling the man who does not know how to appreciate you who could bring himself aunt aunt tatyana interrupted remember what you promised me you always told me yourself truth tatyana truth before everything and independence well, truth's not always sweet, nor independence either, or else where would be the virtue of it? She kissed Kapitolina Markovna on her white hair, and, turning to Litvinov, she went on. We propose, aunt and I, leaving Baden. I think it will be more comfortable so for all of us. When do you think of going? Litvinov said thickly. He remembered that Irina had said the very same words to him not long before. Kapitolina Markovna was darting forward, but Tatyana held her back, with a caressing touch on her shoulder. "'Probably soon, very soon.' "'And will you allow me to ask where you intend going?' Litvinov said in the same voice. First to Dresden, then probably to Russia.' "'But what can you want to know that for now, Grigory Mikhailitch?' cried Kapitolina Markovna. "'Aunt, aunt!' Tatyana interposed again. A brief silence followed. "'Tatyana Petrovna,' began Litvinov, "'you know how astonishingly painful and bitter my feelings must be at this instant.' Tatyana got up. "'Grigory Mikhailitch,' she said, "'we will not talk about that, if you please. I beg you, for my sake, if not for your own. I have known you long enough and I can very well imagine what you must be feeling now. But what's the use of talking, of touching a sore—' She stopped. It was clear she wanted to stem the emotion rushing upon her, to swallow the rising tears. She succeeded. "'Why fret a sore we cannot heal? Leave that to time. And now I have to ask a service of you, Grigory Mikhailitch. If you will be so good, I will give you a letter directly, Take it to the post yourself. It is rather important, 
but aunt and I have no time now. I shall be much obliged to you. Wait a minute, I will bring it directly. In the doorway Tatyana glanced uneasily at Kapitolina Markovna, but she was sitting with such dignity and decorum with such a severe expression on her knitted brows and tightly compressed lips that tatyana merely gave her a significant nod and went out but scarcely had the door closed behind her when every trace of dignity and severity instantaneously vanished from kapitolina markovna's face she got up ran on tiptoe up to litvinov and all hunched together and trying to look him in the face she began in a quaking, tearful whisper. "'Good God!' she said. "'Grigory Mikhailitch, what does it mean? Is it a dream, or what? You gave up Tanya, you tired of her, you breaking your word. You doing this, Grigory Mikhailitch, you on whom we all counted as if you were a stone wall. You, 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 Grisha!' Kapitolina Markovna stopped why you will kill her grigory mikhailitch she went on without waiting for an answer while her tears fairly coursed in fine drops over her cheeks you mustn't judge by her bearing up now you know her character she never complains she does not think of herself so others must think of her she keeps saying to me aunt we must save our dignity but what's dignity when i foresee death death before us Tatyana's chair creaked in the next room. "'Yes, I foresee death,' the old lady went on still more softly. "'And how can such a thing have come about? Is it witchcraft, or what? It's not long since you were writing her the tenderest letters, and in fact can an honest man act like this? I'm a woman, free, as you know, from prejudice of any sort. Esprit fort and i have given tanya too the same sort of education she too has a free mind aunt came tatyana's voice from the next room but one's word of honour is a duty grigory mikhailitch especially for people of your of my principles if we're not going to recognise duty what is left us this cannot be broken off in this way at your whim without regard to what may happen to another it's unprincipled yes it's a crime a strange sort of freedom aunt come here please was heard again i'm coming my love i'm coming kapitolina markovna clutched at litvinov's hand i see you are angry grigory mikhailitch me me angry he wanted to exclaim but his tongue was dumb i don't want to make you angry oh really quite the contrary. I've come even to entreat you. Think again while there is time. Don't destroy her. Don't destroy your own happiness. She will still trust you, Grisha. She will believe in you. Nothing is lost, yet. Why, she loves you as no one will ever love you. Leave this hateful Baden-Baden. Let us go away together. Only throw off this enchantment. And above all, have pity. Have pity aunt called tatyana with a shade of impatience in her voice but kapitolina markovna did not hear her only say yes she repeated to litvinov and i will still make everything smooth you need only nod your head to me just one little nod like this litvinov would gladly he felt have died at that instant but the word yes he did not utter and he did not nod his head Tatyana reappeared with a letter in her hand. Kapitolina Markovna at once darted away from Litvinov, and, averting her face, bent low over the table, as though she were looking over the bills and papers that lay on it. Tatyana went up to Litvinov. "'Here,' she said, "'is the letter I spoke of. You will go to the post at once with it, won't you?' Litvinov raised his eyes. Before him, really, stood his judge. Tatyana struck him as taller, slenderer, her face, shining with unwanted beauty, had the stony grandeur of a statue's. Her bosom did not heave, and her gown, of one colour, and straight as a Greek chiton, fell in the long unbroken folds of marble drapery to her feet, which were hidden by it. 
Tatyana was looking straight before her, only at Litvinov. Her cold, calm gaze, too, was the gaze of a statue. He read his sentence in it, he bowed, took a letter from the hand held out so immovably to him, and silently withdrew. Kapitolina Markovna ran to Tatyana, but the latter turned off her embraces and dropped her eyes. A flush of colour spread over her face, and with the words, and now, the sooner the better, she went into the bedroom. Kapitolina Markovna followed her with hanging head. The letter, entrusted to Litvinov by Tatyana, was addressed to one of her Dresden friends, a German lady who let small furnished apartments. Litvinov dropped the letter into the post-box, and it seemed to him, as though, with that tiny scrap of paper, he was dropping all his past, all his life, into the tomb. He went out of the town, and strolled a long time by narrow paths between vineyards. He could not shake off the persistent sensation of contempt for himself, like the importunate buzzing of flies in summer. An unenviable part, indeed, he had played in the last interview and when he went back to his hotel, and after a little time inquired about the ladies, he was told that immediately after he had gone out they had given orders to be driven to the railway station, and had departed by the mail train, to what destination was not known. Their things had been packed and their bills paid ever since the morning. Tatyana had asked Litvinov to take her letter to the post, obviously with the object of getting him out of the way. He ventured to ask the hall-porter whether the ladies had left any letters for him, but the porter replied in the negative, and looked amazed even. It was clear that this sudden exit from rooms taken for a week struck him, too, as strange and dubious. Litvinov turned his back on him, and locked himself up in his room. He did not leave it till the following day. The greater part of the night he was sitting at the table, writing, and tearing what he had written. The dawn was already beginning when he finished his task. It was a letter to Irina. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of Smoke » by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 This was what was in this letter to Irina. My betrothed went away yesterday. We shall never see each other again. I do not know even for certain where she is going to live. With her she takes all that till now seemed precious and desirable to me. All my previous ideas, my plans, my intentions, have gone with her. My labours even are wasted, my work of years ends in nothing. All my pursuits have no meaning, no applicability all that is dead myself my old self is dead and buried since yesterday i feel i see i know this clearly far am i from regretting this not to lament of it have i begun upon this to you as though i could complain when you love me irina i wanted only to tell you that of all this dead past all those hopes and efforts turned to smoke and ashes there is only one thing left living, invincible, my love for you. Except that love, nothing is left for me. To say it is the sole thing precious to me would be too little. I live wholly in that love. That love is my whole being. In it are my future, my career, my vocation, my country. You know me, Irina. You know that fine talk of any sort is foreign to my nature, hateful to me, and however strong the words in which I try to express my feelings, you will have no doubts of their sincerity, you will not suppose them exaggerated. I'm not a boy, in the impulse of momentary ecstasy, lisping unreflecting vows to you, but a man of matured age, simply and plainly, almost with terror, telling you what he has recognized for unmistakable truth. Yes, your love has replaced everything for me, everything, everything. Judge for yourself. Can I leave this, my all, in the hands of another? Can I let him dispose of you? You, you will belong to him. My whole being, my heart's blood will belong to him, while I myself, 
Where am I? What am I? An outsider, an onlooker, looking on at my own life. No, that's impossible, impossible. To share, to share in secret that without which it's useless, impossible to live, that's deceit and death. I know how great a sacrifice I am asking of you, without any sort of right to it. Indeed, what can give one a right to sacrifice? But I am not acting thus from egoism. An egoist would find it easier and smoother not to raise this question at all. Yes, my demands are difficult, and I am not surprised that they alarm you. The people among whom you have to live are hateful to you, you are sick of society. But are you strong enough to throw up that society, to trample on the success it has crowned you with, to rouse public opinion against you, the opinion of these hateful people? Ask yourself, Irina, don't take a burden upon you greater than you can bear. I don't want to reproach you, but remember, once already you could not hold out against temptation. I can give you so little in return for all you are losing. Hear my last word. If you don't feel capable to-morrow, to-day even, of leaving all and following me, you see how boldly I speak, how little I spare myself, if you are frightened at the uncertainty of the future, and estrangement and solitude and the censure of men, if you cannot rely on yourself, in fact, tell me so openly and without delay, and I will go away. I shall go with a broken heart, but I shall bless you for your truthfulness. But if you really, my beautiful radiant queen, love a man so petty, so obscure as I, and are really ready to share his fate, well, then, give me your hand, and let us set off together on our difficult way. Only understand, my decision is unchanging, either all or nothing. It's unreasonable, but I could not do otherwise. I cannot, Irina. I love you too much. Yours, G. L. Litvinov did not much like this letter himself. It did not quite truly and exactly express what he wanted to say. It was full of awkward expressions, high-flown or bookish, and doubtless it was not better than many of the other letters he had torn up. But it was the last, the chief point was thoroughly stated anyway, and harassed and worn out, Litvinov did not feel capable of dragging anything else out of his head. Besides, he did not possess the faculty of putting his thought into literary form, and like all people with whom it is not habitual, he took great trouble over the style. His first letter was probably the best. It came warmer from the heart. However that might be, Litvinov dispatched his missive to Irina. She replied in a brief note. "'Come to me to-day,' she wrote to him. "'He has gone away for the whole day.' Your letter has greatly disturbed me. I keep thinking, thinking, and my head is in a whirl. I am very wretched, but you love me, and I am happy. Come. Yours. I. She was sitting in her boudoir when Litvinov went in. He was conducted there by the same little girl of thirteen, who on the previous day had watched for him on the stairs. On the table before Irina, was standing an open, semicircular, cardboard box of lace. She was carelessly turning over the lace with one hand, in the other she was holding Litvinov's letter. She had only just left off crying. Her eyelashes were wet, and her eyelids swollen. On her cheeks could be seen the traces of undried tears not wiped away. Litvinov stood in the doorway. She did not notice his entrance. "'You are crying?' he said, wonderingly. She started, passed her hand over her hair, and smiled. "'Why are you crying?' repeated Litvinov. She pointed in silence to the letter. "'So you were... over that?' he articulated haltingly. "'Come here, sit down,' she said. "'Give me your hand.' "'Well, yes, I was crying. What are you surprised at? Is that nothing?' She pointed again to the letter. Litvinov sat down. I know it's not easy, Irina, I tell you so indeed in my letter. I understand your position. But if you believe in the value of your love for me, if my words have convinced you, you ought, too, to understand what I feel now at the sight of your tears. I have come here like a man on his trial, 
and I await what is to be my sentence? Death or life? Your answer decides everything. Only don't look at me with those eyes. They remind me of the eyes I saw in old days in Moscow. Irina flushed at once, and turned away, as though herself conscious of something evil in her gaze. Why do you say that, Grigory? For shame! You want to know my answer. Do you mean to say you can doubt it? You are troubled by my tears, but you don't understand them. Your letter, dearest, has set me thinking. Here you write that my love has replaced everything for you, that even your former studies can never now be put into practice. But I ask myself, can a man live for love alone? Won't it weary him at last? Won't he want an active career, and won't he cast the blame on what drew him away from active life? That's the thought that dismays me. That's what I'm afraid of, and not what you imagine." Litvinov looked intently at Irina, and Irina intently looked at him, as though each would penetrate deeper and further into the soul of the other deeper and further than word can reach, or word betray. "'You are wrong in being afraid of that,' began Litvinov. "'I must have expressed myself badly. Weariness? Inactivity? With the new impetus your love will give me? Oh, Irina, in your love there's a whole world for me, and I can't yet foresee myself what may develop from it.' Irina grew thoughtful. "'Where are we going?' she whispered. "'Where?' we will talk of that later. But of course, then, then you agree? You agree, Irina? She looked at him. And you will be happy? Oh, Irina! You will regret nothing? Never? She bent over the cardboard box, and again began looking over the lace in it. Don't be angry with me, dear one, for attending to this trash at such a moment. I am obliged to go to a ball at a certain lady's, these bits of finery have been sent me, and I must choose to-day. Ah! I am awfully wretched!" she cried suddenly, and she laid her face down on the edge of the box. Tears began falling again from her eyes. She turned away. The tears might spoil the lace. Irina, you are crying again, Litvinov began uneasily. Ah, yes, again, Irina interposed hurriedly. Oh, Grigory, don't torture me, don't torture yourself. Let us be free people. What does it matter if I do cry? And indeed, do I know myself why my tears are flowing? You know, you have heard my decision. You believe it will not be changed. That I agree to, what was it you said? To all or nothing. What more would you have? Let us be free. Why these mutual chains? We are alone together now. You love me. I love you. Is it possible we have nothing to do but wringing our thoughts out of each other? Look at me. I don't want to talk about myself. I have never by one word hinted that for me, perhaps, it was not so easy to set at naught my duty as a wife. And, of course, I don't deceive myself. I know I am a criminal, and that he has a right to kill me. Well, what of it? Let us be free, I say. Today is ours a lifetime's ours." She got up from the armchair and looked at Litvinov with her head thrown back, faintly smiling and moving her eyebrows, while with one arm bare to the elbow she pushed back from her face a long tress on which a few tears glistened. A rich scarf slipped from the table and fell on the floor at Irina's feet. She trampled contemptuously on it. "'Or don't you like me to-day? Have I grown ugly since yesterday?' Tell me, have you often seen a prettier hand? And this hair? Tell me, do you love me?" She clasped him in both arms, held his head close to her bosom, her comb fell out with a ringing sound, and her falling hair wrapped him in a soft flood of fragrance. End of chapter 23「Chapter Twenty Four of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four Litvinov walked up and down his room in the hotel, his head bowed in thought. He had now to pass from theory to practice, to devise ways and means for flight, for moving to unknown countries. 
but, strange to say, he was not pondering so much upon ways and means, as upon whether actually, beyond doubt, the decision had been reached on which he had so obstinately persisted. Had the ultimate, irrevocable word been uttered? But Irina, to be sure, had said to him at parting, Act, act, and when everything is ready, only let me know. That was final. Away with all doubts. He must proceed to action. And Litvinov proceeded, in the meantime, to calculation. Money, first of all. Litvinov had, he found, in ready money, one thousand three hundred and twenty-eight guldens, in French money, two thousand eight hundred and fifty-five francs. The sum was trifling, but it was enough for the first necessities, and then he must at once write to his father to send him all he could. He would have to sell the forest part of the land. But on what pretext? Well, a pretext would be found. Irina had spoken, it's true, of her bijou, but that must not be taken into his reckoning. That, who knows, might come in for a rainy day. He had, besides, a good Geneva watch, for which he might get, well, say, four hundred francs. Litvinov went to a banker's, and with much circumlocution introduced the question whether it was possible, in case of need, to borrow money. But bankers at Baden are wary old foxes, and in response to such circumlocutions they promptly assume a drooping and blighted air, for all the world like a wild flower whose stalk has been severed by the scythe some indeed laugh outright in your face as though appreciating an innocent joke on your part litvinov to his shame even tried his luck at roulette even o oh, ignominy put a thaler on the number thirty corresponding with his own age he did this with a view to augmenting and rounding off his capital if he did not augment it he certainly did round off his capital by losing the odd twenty-eight guldens there was a second question, also not an unimportant one. That was the passport. But for a woman a passport is not quite so obligatory, and there are countries where it is not required at all, Belgium, for instance, and England. Besides, one might even get some other passport, not Russian. Litvinov pondered very seriously on all this. His decision was firm, absolutely unwavering, and yet all the time against his will, overriding his will, something not serious, almost humorous came in, filtered through his musings, as though the very enterprise were a comic business. And no one ever did elope with any one in reality, but only in plays and novels, and perhaps somewhere in the provinces, in some of those remote districts, where, according to the statements of travellers, people are literally sick continually from ennui. At that point Litvinov recalled how an acquaintance of his, a retired cornet, Batsov, had eloped with a merchant's daughter in a staging sledge with bells and three horses, having as a preliminary measure made the parents drunk, and adopted the same precaution as well with the bride, and how, as it afterwards turned out, he was outwitted, and within an ace of a thrashing into the bargain. Litvinov felt exceedingly irritated with himself for such inappropriate reminiscences, and then, with the recollection of Tatyana, her sudden departure, all that grief and suffering and shame, he felt only too acutely that the affair he was arranging was deadly earnest, and how right he had been when he had told Irina that his honour even left no other course open and again, at the mere name, something of flame turned with sweet ache about his heart, and died away again. The tramp of horses' hoofs sounded behind him. He moved aside. Irina overtook him on horseback. Beside her rode the stout general. She recognized Litvinov, nodded to him, and lashing her horse with a side-stroke of her whip, she put him into a gallop, and suddenly dashed away at headlong speed her dark veil fluttering in the wind. Pas si vite! Nom de Dieu! Pas si vite! cried the general, and he too galloped after her. End of chapter 24
Chapter Twenty Five of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Five. The next morning, Litvinov had only just come home from seeing the banker, with whom he had had another conversation on the playful instability of our exchange and the best means of sending money abroad, when the hotel porter handed him a letter. He recognized Irina's handwriting, and without breaking the seal, a presentiment of evil, heaven knows why, was astir in him. He went into his room. This was what he read. The letter was in French. My dear one, I have been thinking all night of your plan. I am not going to shuffle with you. You have been open with me, and I will be open with you. I cannot run away with you. I have not the strength to do it. I feel how I am wronging you. My second sin is greater than the first. I despise myself, my cowardice, I cover myself with reproaches, but I cannot change myself. In vain I tell myself that I have destroyed your happiness, that you have the right now to regard me as a frivolous flirt, that I myself drew you on, that I have given you solemn promises. I am full of horror, of hatred for myself, but I can't do otherwise. I can't. I can't. I don't want to justify myself. I won't tell you I was carried away myself. All that's of no importance. But I want to tell you, and to say it again and yet again, I am yours, yours for ever. Do with me as you will when you will, free from all obligation, from all responsibility. I am yours. But run away, throw up everything. No, no, no. I besought you to save me, I hoped to wipe out everything, to burn up the past as in a fire, but I see there is no salvation for me, I see the poison has gone too deeply into me, I see one cannot breathe this atmosphere for years with impunity. I have long hesitated whether to write you this letter, I dread to think what decision you may come to, I trust only to your love for me, but I felt it would be dishonest on my part to hide the truth from you especially as perhaps you have already begun to take the first steps for carrying out our project. Ah, it was lovely, but impracticable. Oh, my dear one, think me a weak, worthless woman. Despise, but don't abandon me. Don't abandon your Irina. To leave this life I have not the courage, but live it without you I cannot either. We soon go back to Petersburg. Come there, live there we will find occupation for you. Your labours in the past shall not be thrown away. You shall find good use for them. Only live near me. Only love me, such as I am, with all my weaknesses and my vices, and believe me, no heart will ever be so tenderly devoted to you as the heart of your Irina. Come soon to me. I shall not have an instant's peace until I see you. Yours, yours, yours. I. The blood beat like a sledge-hammer in Litvinov's head, then slowly and painfully sank to his heart, and was chill as a stone in it. He read through Irina's letter, and just as on that day at Moscow he fell in exhaustion on the sofa, and stayed there motionless. A dark abyss seemed suddenly to have opened on all sides of him, and he stared into this darkness in senseless despair. And so again, again deceit no worse than deceit lying and baseness and life shattered everything torn up by its roots utterly and the sole thing which he could cling to the last prop in fragments too come after us to petersburg he repeated with a bitter inward laugh we will find you occupation find me a place as a head clerk eh and who are we here there's a hint of her past here we have the secret, hideous, something I know nothing of, but which she has been trying to wipe out, to burn as in a fire. Here we have that world of intrigues, of secret relations, of shameful stories of Bielskis and Dolskis, and what a future, what a lovely part awaiting me! To live close to her, visit her, share with her the morbid melancholy of the lady of fashion who is sick and weary of the world, but can't live outside its circle. Be the friend of the house, of course, of his excellency, until, 
until the whim changes and the plebeian lover loses his piquancy and is replaced by that fat general or mr finikov that's possible and pleasant and i dare say useful she talks of a good use for my talents but the other project's impracticable impracticable in litvinov's soul rose like sudden gusts of wind before a storm momentary impulses of fury every expression in irina's letter roused his indignation her very assertions of her unchanging feeling affronted him she can't let it go like that he cried at last i won't allow her to play with my life so mercilessly litvinov jumped up snatched his hat but what was he to do run to her answer her letter he stopped short and his hands fell yes what was to be done had he not himself put this fatal choice to her it had not turned out as he had wished there was that risk about every choice she had changed her mind it was true she herself had declared at first that she would throw up everything and follow him that was true too but she did not deny her guilt she called herself a weak woman she did not want to deceive him she had been deceived in herself what answer could be made to that at any rate she was not hypocritical she was not deceiving him she was open remorselessly open there was nothing forced her to speak out nothing to prevent her from soothing him with promises putting things off and keeping it all in uncertainty till her departure till her departure with her husband for italy but she had ruined his life ruined two lives what of that but as regards tatyana she was not guilty the guilt was his his litvinov's alone and he had no right to shake off the responsibility his own sin had laid with iron yoke upon him all this was so but what was left him to do now again he flung himself on the sofa and again in gloom darkly dimly without trace without devouring swiftness the minutes raced past and why not obey her flashed through his brain she loves me she is mine and in our very yearning towards each other in this passion which after so many years has burst upon us and forced its way out with such violence is there not something inevitable irresistible like a law of nature live in petersburg and shall i be the first to be put in such a position and how could we be in safety together and he fell to musing and irina's shape in the guise in which it was imprinted for ever in his late memories softly rose before him but not for long he mastered himself and with a fresh outburst of indignation drove away from him both those memories and that seductive image you give me to drink from that golden cup he cried but there is poison in the draught and your white wings are besmirched with mire away remain here with you after the way i i drove away my betrothed a deed of infamy of infamy he wrung his hands with anguish and another face with the stamp of suffering on its still features with dumb reproach in its farewell eyes rose from the depths and for a long time litvinov was in this agony still for a long time his tortured thought like a man fever-stricken tossed from side to side he grew calm at last at last he came to a decision from the very first instant he had a presentiment of this decision it had appeared to him at first like a distant hardly perceptible point in the midst of the darkness and turmoil of his inward conflict then it had begun to move nearer and nearer till it ended by cutting with icy edge into his heart litvinov once more dragged his box out of the corner once more he packed all his things without haste even with a kind of stupid carefulness rang for the waiter paid his bill and dispatched to irina a note in russian to the following purport i don't know whether you are doing me a greater wrong now than then but i know this present blow is infinitely heavier it is the end you tell me i cannot and i repeat to you i cannot do what you want i cannot and i don't want to don't answer me you are not capable of giving me the only answer i would accept i am going away to-morrow early by the first train good-bye may you be happy 
we shall in all probability not see each other again. Till night-time Litvinov did not leave his room. God knows whether he was expecting anything. About seven o'clock in the evening, a lady in a black mantle with a veil on her face, twice approached the steps of his hotel. Moving a little aside and gazing far away into the distance, she suddenly made a resolute gesture with her hand, and for the third time went towards the steps. "'Where are you going, Irina Pavlovna?' she heard a voice utter with effort behind her. She turned with nervous swiftness. Potugin ran up to her. She stopped short, thought a moment, and fairly flung herself towards him, took his arm, and drew him away. "'Take me away! Take me away!' she repeated breathlessly. "'What is it, Irina Pavlovna?' he muttered in bewilderment. "'Take me away!' she reiterated, with redoubled force. "'If you don't want me to remain for ever, there!' Potugin bent his head submissively, and hurriedly they went away together. The following morning early Litvinov was perfectly ready for his journey. Into his room walked Potugin. He went up to him in silence, and in silence shook his hand. Litvinov, too, said nothing. Both of them wore long faces, and both vainly tried to smile. "'I came to wish you a good journey,' Potugin brought out at last. "'And how did you know I was going to-day?' asked Litvinov. Potugin looked on the floor around him. "'I became aware of it, as you see. Our last conversation took in the end such a strange turn. I did not want to part from you without expressing my sincere good feeling for you. "'You have good feeling for me now, when I am going away?' Potugin looked mournfully at Litvinov. "'Ah, Grigory Mikhailitch, Grigory Mikhailitch,' he began with a short sigh. "'It's no time for that with us now, no time for delicacy or fencing. You don't, so far as I have been able to perceive, take much interest in our national literature, and so, perhaps, you have no clear conception of Vaska Buslaev? Of whom? Of Vaska Buslaev, the hero of Novgorod, in Kirsch Danilov's collection. What Buslaev? said Litvinov, somewhat puzzled by the unexpected turn of the conversation. I don't know. Well, never mind. I only wanted to draw your attention to something. Vaska Buslaev, after he had taken away his Novgorodians on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and there, to their horror, bathed all naked in the holy river Jordan, for he believed not in omen nor in dream, nor in the flight of birds, this logical Vaska Buslaev climbed up Mount Tabor, and on the top of this mountain there lies a great stone, over which men of every kind have tried in vain to jump. Vaska, too, ventured to try his luck and he chanced upon a dead head, a human skull in his road. He kicked it away with his foot. So the skull said to him, Why do you kick me? I knew how to live, and I know how to roll in the dust, and it will be the same with you. And in fact, Vaska jumps over the stone, and he did quite clear it, but he caught his heel and broke his skull. And in this place, I must by the way observe that it wouldn't be amiss for our friends, the Slavophiles, who are so fond of kicking dead heads and decaying nationalities underfoot to ponder over that legend. "'But what does all that mean?' Litvinov interposed impatiently at last. "'Excuse me, it's time for me—' "'Why this?' answered Potugin, and his eyes beamed with such affectionate warmth as Litvinov had not even expected of him. "'This, that you did not spurn a dead human head, and for your goodness perhaps you may succeed in leaping over the fatal stone. I won't keep you any longer, only let me embrace you at parting. I'm not going to try to leap over it even, Litvinov declared, kissing Potugin three times, and the bitter sensations filling his soul were replaced for an instant by pity for the poor lonely creature. But I must go, I must go, he moved about the room. "'Can I carry anything for you?' Potugin proffered his services. "'No, thank you. Don't trouble. I can manage.' He put on his cap, took up his bag. "'So you say. 
he queried, stopping in the doorway. "'You have seen her?' "'Yes, I've seen her.' "'Well, tell me about her.' Potugin was silent a moment. "'She expected you yesterday, and today she will expect you.' "'Ah, well, tell her... no, there's no need, no need of anything. Good-bye, good-bye. Good-bye, Grigory Mikhailitch. Let me say one word more to you. You still have time to listen to me. There's more than half an hour before the train starts. You are returning to Russia. There you will, in time, get to work. Allow an old chatterbox, for, alas, I am a chatterbox, and nothing more, to give you advice for your journey. Every time it is your lot to undertake any piece of work, ask yourself, are you serving the cause of civilization, in the true and strict sense of the word? Are you promoting one of the ideals of civilization? Have your labours that educating, Europeanizing character, which alone is beneficial and profitable in our day among us? If it is so, go boldly forward. You are on the right path, and your work is a blessing. Thank God for it. You are not alone now. You will not be a sower in the desert. There are plenty of workers, pioneers, even among us now. But you have no ears for this now. Good-bye. Don't forget me." Litvinov descended the staircase at a run, flung himself into a carriage, and drove to the station, not once looking round at the town where so much of his personal life was left behind. He abandoned himself, as it were, to the tide. It snatched him up and bore him along, and he firmly resolved not to struggle against it. All other exercise of independent will he renounced. He was just taking his seat in the railway carriage. Grigory Mikhailitch, Grigory, he heard a supplicating whisper behind him. He started. Could it be Irina? Yes, it was she. Wrapped in her maid's shawl, a travelling hat on her dishevelled hair, she was standing on the platform, and gazing at him with worn and weary eyes. "'Come back, come back! I have come for you,' those eyes were saying. And what, what were they not promising? She did not move. She had not power to add a word. Everything about her, even the disorder of her dress, everything seemed entreating forgiveness. Litvinov was almost beaten, scarcely could he keep from rushing to her but the tide to which he had surrendered himself reasserted itself. He jumped into the carriage, and, turning round, he motioned Irina to a place beside him. She understood him. There was still time. One step, one movement, and two lives made one for ever would have been hurried away into the uncertain distance. While she wavered, a loud whistle sounded, and the train moved off. Litvinov sank back, while Irina moved staggering to a seat, and fell on it, to the immense astonishment of a supernumerary diplomatic official who chanced to be lounging about the railway station. He was slightly acquainted with Irina, and greatly admired her, and seeing that she lay as though overcome by faintness, he imagined that she had une attaque de nerf, and therefore deemed it his duty, the duty d'un galant chevalier, to go to her assistance but his astonishment assumed far greater proportions when, at the first word addressed to her, she suddenly got up, repulsed his proffered arm, and hurrying out into the street, had in a few instants vanished in the milky vapour of fog, so characteristic of the climate of the black forest in the early days of autumn. End of chapter 25 Chapter Twenty Six of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Six. We happened once to go into the hut of a peasant woman who had just lost her only passionately loved son, and to our considerable astonishment, we found her perfectly calm, almost cheerful. Let her be, said her husband, to whom probably our astonishment was apparent she has gone numb now. And Litvinov had, in the same way, gone numb. The same sort of calm came over him during the first hours of the journey. Utterly crushed, 
hopelessly wretched as he was, still he was at rest, at rest after the agonies and sufferings of the last few weeks, after all the blows which had fallen one after another upon his head. They had been the more shattering for him that he was little fitted by nature for such tempests. Now he really hoped for nothing, and tried not to remember, above all not to remember. He was going to Russia. He had to go somewhere. But he was making no kind of plans regarding his own personality. He did not recognize himself. He did not comprehend his own actions. He had positively lost his real identity. And, in fact, he took very little interest in his own identity. Sometimes it seemed to him that he was taking his own corpse home, and only the bitter spasms of irremediable spiritual pain passing over him from time to time brought him back to a sense of still being alive. At times it struck him as incomprehensible that a man, a man, could let a woman, let love, have such power over him. Ignominious weakness, he muttered, and shook back his cloak and sat up more squarely, as though to say, the past is over, let's begin fresh. A moment, and he could only smile bitterly and wonder at himself. He fell to looking out of the window. It was grey and damp, there was no rain, but the fog still hung about, and low clouds trailed across the sky. The wind blew facing the train. Whitish clouds of steam, some singly, others mingled with other darker clouds of smoke, whirled in endless file past the window at which Litvinov was sitting. He began to watch this steam, this smoke. Incessantly mounting, rising and falling, twisting and hooking on to the grass, to the bushes, as though in sportive antics, lengthening out and hiding away, clouds upon clouds flew by, they were for ever changing, and stayed still the same in their monotonous, hurrying, wearisome sport. Sometimes the wind changed, the line bent to right or left, and suddenly the whole mass vanished, and at once reappeared at the opposite window. Then again the huge tail was flung out, and again it veiled Litvinov's view of the vast plain of the Rhine. He gazed and gazed, and a strange reverie came over him. He was alone in the compartment. There was no one to disturb him. Smoke! Smoke! he repeated several times, and suddenly it all seemed as smoke to him. Everything, his own life, Russian life, everything human, especially everything Russian. All smoke and steam, he thought, all seems forever changing, on all sides new forms, phantoms flying after phantoms, while in reality it is all the same and the same again, everything hurrying, flying towards something, and everything vanishing without a trace, attaining to nothing. Another wind blows, and all is dashing in the opposite direction, and there again the same untiring, restless, and useless gambles. He remembered much that had taken place with clamour and flourish before his eyes in the last few years. Smoke! he whispered, smoke. He remembered the hot disputes, the wrangling, the clamour at Gubaryov's, and in other sets of men, of high and low degree, advanced and reactionist, old and young. Smoke, he repeated, smoke and steam. He remembered, too, the fashionable picnic, and he remembered various opinions and speeches of other political personages, even all Potugin's sermonizing. Smoke! smoke, nothing but smoke. And what of his own struggles and passions and agonies and dreams? He could only reply with a gesture of despair. And meanwhile the train dashed on and on. By now Rashdat, Karlsruhe, and Bruchsal had long been left far behind. The mountains on the right side of the line swerved aside, retreated into the distance, then moved up again but not so high, and more thinly covered with trees. The train made a sharp turn, and there was Heidelberg. The carriage rolled in under the cover of the station. There was the shouting of newspaper boys, selling papers of all sorts, even Russian. Passengers began bustling in their seats, getting out onto the platform. 
but litvinov did not leave his corner and still sat on with downcast head suddenly someone called him by name he raised his eyes bindasov's ugly fizz was thrust in at the window and behind him or was he dreaming no it was really so all the familiar baden faces there was madame suhantchikov there was voroshilov and bombeyev too they all rushed up to him while bindasov bellowed but where's pishtalkin we were expecting him but it's all the same hop out and we'll be off to gubaryov's yes my boy yes gubaryov's expecting us bombeyev confirmed making way for him hop out Litvinov would have flown into a rage but for a dead load lying on his heart. He glanced at Bindasov and turned away without speaking. "'I tell you Gubayov's here!' shrieked Madame Suhantchikov, her eyes fairly starting out of her head. Litvinov did not stir a muscle. "'Come, do listen, Litvinov,' Bombeyev began at last. "'There's not only Gubayov here, there's a whole phalanx here of the most splendid, most intellectual young fellows, Russians, and all studying the natural sciences, all of the noblest convictions. Really, you must stop here, if it's only for them. Here, for instance, there's a certain... There, I've forgotten his surname, but he's a genius, simply. Oh, let him be, let him be, Rostislav Ardalionovitch interposed madame suhantchikov let him be you see what sort of a fellow he is and all his family are the same he has an aunt at first she struck me as a sensible woman but the day before yesterday i went to see her here she had only just before gone to baden and was back here again before you could look round well i went to see her began questioning her would you believe me i couldn't get a word out of the stuck-up thing it aristocrat poor kapitolina markovna an aristocrat could she ever have anticipated such a humiliation but litvinov still held his peace turned away and pulled his cap over his eyes the train started at last well say something at parting at least you stony-hearted man shouted bombeyev this is really too much rotten milksop yelled bindasov the carriages were moving more and more rapidly, and he could vent his abuse with impunity. Niggardly stick in the mud! Whether Bindasov invented this last appellation on the spot, or whether it had come to him second-hand, it apparently gave great satisfaction to two of the noble young fellows studying natural science, who happened to be standing by, for only a few days later it appeared in the russian periodical sheet published at that time at heidelberg under the title a tout venant de croche or we don't care a hang for anybody but litvinov repeated again smoke 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 here he thought in heidelberg now are over a hundred russian students they're all studying chemistry physics physiology they won't even hear of anything else, but in five or six years' time there won't be fifteen at the lectures by the same celebrated professors. The wind will change, the smoke will be blowing, in another quarter smoke, smoke. Heidelberg Towards nightfall he passed by Kassel. With the darkness intolerable anguish pounced like a hawk upon him, and he wept burying himself in the corner of the carriage for a long time his tears flowed not easing his heart but torturing him with a sort of gnawing bitterness while at the same time in one of the hotels of castle tatyana was lying in bed feverishly ill kapitolina markovna was sitting beside her tanya she was saying for god's sake let me send a telegram to grigory mikhailitch do let me, Tanya. No, aunt, she answered. You mustn't. Don't be frightened. Give me some water. It will soon pass. And a week later she did, in fact, recover, and the two friends continued their journey. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty seven. Stopping neither at Petersburg nor at Moscow, Litvinov went back to his estate. He was dismayed when he saw his father. The latter was so weak and failing. The old man rejoiced to have his son, as far as a man can rejoice, who is just at the close of life. He at once gave over to him the management of everything, which was in great disorder, and lingering on a few weeks longer, he departed from this earthly sphere. Litvinov was left alone in his ancient little manor-house, and with a heavy heart, without hope, without zeal, and without money, he began to work the land. Working the land is a cheerless business, as many know too well. We will not enlarge on how distasteful it seemed to Litvinov. As for reforms and innovations, there was, of course, no question even of them. The practical application of the information he had gathered abroad was put off for an indefinite period. Poverty forced him to make shift from day to day, to consent to all sorts of compromises, both material and moral. The new had begun ill, the old had lost all power. Ignorance jostled up against dishonesty. The whole agrarian organization was shaken and unstable as quagmire bog, and only one great word, freedom, was wafted like the breath of God over the waters. Patience was needed before all things, and a patience not passive, but active, persistent, not without tact and cunning at times. For Litvinov, in his frame of mind, it was doubly hard. He had but little will to live left in him. Where was he to get the will to labour and take trouble? But a year passed, after it another passed, the third was beginning. The mighty idea was being realised by degrees, was passing into flesh and blood. The young shoot had sprung up from the scattered seed, and its foes, both open and secret, could not stamp it out now. Litvinov himself, though he had ended by giving up the greater part of his land to the peasants on the half-profit system, that's to say, by returning to the wretched primitive methods, had yet succeeded in doing something. He had restored the factory, set up a tiny farm with five free-hired labourers, he had had at different times fully forty, and had paid his principal private debts. And his spirit had gained strength, he had begun to be like the old Litvinov again. It's true, a deeply buried melancholy never left him, and he was too quiet for his years. He shut himself up in a narrow circle, and broke off all his old connections. But the deadly indifference had passed, and among the living he moved and acted as a living man again. The last traces, too, had vanished of the enchantment in which he had been held all that had passed at Baden appeared to him dimly as in a dream. And Irina? Even she had paled and vanished too, and Litvinov only had a faint sense of something dangerous behind the mist that gradually enfolded her image. Of Tatyana news reached him from time to time. He knew that she was living with her aunt on her estate, a hundred and sixty miles from him, leading a quiet life, going out little, and scarcely receiving any guests. Cheerful and well, however. It happened on one fine May day, that he was sitting in his study, listlessly turning over the last number of a Petersburg paper. A servant came to announce the arrival of an old uncle. This uncle happened to be a cousin of Kapitolina Markovna, and had been recently staying with her. He had bought an estate in Litvinov's vicinity, and was on his way thither. He stayed twenty-four hours with his nephew, and told him a great deal about Tatyana's manner of life. The next day, after his departure, Litvinov sent her a letter, the first since their separation. He begged for permission to renew her acquaintance, at least by correspondence, and also desired to learn whether he must for ever give up all idea of some day seeing her again. Not without emotion he awaited the answer. The answer came at last. Tatyana responded cordially to his overture. "'If you are disposed to pay us a visit,' she finished up, "'we hope you will come. You know the saying, even the sick are easier together than apart.' Kapitolina Markovna joined in sending her regards. 
Litvinov was as happy as a child. It was long since his heart had beaten with such delight over anything. He felt suddenly light and bright. Just as when the sun rises and drives away the darkness of night, a light breeze flutters with the sun's rays over the face of the reviving earth. All that day Litvinov kept smiling, even while he went about his farm and gave his orders. He at once began making arrangements for the journey, and a fortnight later he was on his way to Tatyana. End of chapter 27